Friends, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So if, if you could use one word or one phrase to describe this last week for you, what would that one word or phrase be? Think about it. You know, try to identify that, what, that one word or, or phrase. Maybe it's busy. Maybe that word is lonely. Maybe that word is friends. Maybe that, that one word might be disaster. Hopefully not brought on by the friends, right? Maybe that one word would be boring or depressed or impatient or excited. Maybe, maybe that word is sad or frustrated or exhausted, distracted. Maybe that word is dedicated, guilty, ashamed. T take a moment and, and think of that one word or phrase that would kind of summarize or describe your last week. Got that word? So now, now thinking of that word or that phrase, ask yourself, how did it affect your attitude last week? And then taking that, that same word or phrase, how did that word, and even if you don't, didn't know that word until just, just this moment ago, how did, how did that summary of your week and how your week went, how did that affect how you spent your time? Or that, that same one word or phrase, how did it affect what you wanted to do with your week or what you should have done with your week? You know, I ask all these things because humans live by words. We let words govern how we live. These words that, that are beliefs about ourselves or these words that describe our beliefs about our relationships or these words that describe our beliefs about the world. And when we believe those things and we act in accordance with, with these words that we live by, it, it changes how we spend our time and how, how we think about life and, and, and what, what our attitude is. You could say it this way. We give those words, even when we don't realize what those words are that we're operating by, we give those words and beliefs authority over our attitudes and our priorities and our habits. So, what word do you live by? And, and then maybe we should ask the disciples question. What word are you called to live by? You know, Mark, in his gospel, he shares this, this scene from the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And what's interesting about this, this scene from the, from the beginning of Jesus' ministry, at least according to Mark, is that before the people are amazed by Jesus calming a storm, and before people are amazed by Jesus healing a disease, and, and before people are amazed by Jesus raising somebody from the dead, people are amazed at the authority of Jesus' word. Check this out in Mark chapter 1, starting at verse 21 and 22. Let's, let's read this right now together. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Now, I'm, I'm sure that whatever Jesus said to them was profound, right? It's Jesus, of course, whatever he says is going to be profound. But what's interesting about how Mark describes the scene is that he doesn't tell us what Jesus said, 
He only told us that the people who heard his teaching were astonished at his authority. What was amazing to these people was, was the authority with which Jesus taught. It was authority that was even more than the scribes. Now, now this won't be a one-for-one one comparison, but, but those, those scribes back then had, had, were considered to have great authority about how you should be living life in accordance with, with, with God's word. And Jesus' authority is, is more than the scribes' authority, but, but you kind of think, well, what would be like a modern-day scribe? Uh, let me try this out. We live in a world full of self-help books and leadership podcasts and Instagram reels and YouTube videos and cable news talking heads and friends and family and opinionated uncles. And they all are like modern day scribes. They all have words that they want you to live by. And maybe that's where we should pause and say, you know what? As humans, we live by words, and sometimes they're our own words. The words that, that we perceive how, how we're experiencing life, and, and if that word is sad or depressed or excited, we live in according, we live according to, to those words about how we're experiencing life. But we also live by other people's words, don't we? And we let those words have authority over our lives. And so these modern day scribes, they tell you how you are supposed to live and what you are supposed to believe and how you should spend your time. Friends, in the presence of Jesus, the people gathered, gathered in this synagogue were astonished at the authority of Jesus' word. Astonished. Because the authority of Jesus' word is greater authority. His authority is something that, that comes from more than just having a fancy school degree. And his authority comes from something that is greater than just being the greatest Instagram influencer. And Jesus' authority comes from something greater than, than just having a personal opinion. It's coming from something greater than even the latest scientific research. See, because what Jesus is doing and what his word is about, it's, it's not just an attractive lifestyle that he's promoting. Jesus' word is an all-encompassing authority that demands that everything in your entire life revolves around him. It's an astonishing authority. You know, I mentioned uh, that, that last week my wife and I were in Washington, D.C., and while we were there, we, we ended up going to the Museum of the Bible uh, for a day. And by the way, I got to say, just as an aside, the Museum of the Bible was, was a fantastic experience, and you can learn a lot while, <coughs> while, while you're there and really gain an appreciation for what, what the Bible is and all the different aspects of it. So if you're ever in Washington, D.C., and you have a day to spend, uh, ch check out the Museum of the Bible. But uh, while we were there, uh, we, we, we came across this, this display where it had a bunch of uh, touch screens, and, and, and you could uh, take a survey on those touch screens. And then behind the touch screens was this really big uh, display that, that kind of displayed all the results from the surveys. And these surveys were not like, well, what, how was your experience at the Museum of the Bible today? It was, it was things about the Bible. And there was this one question that really stuck out to me. And you can see it on the screen. The question was, do you agree that the Bible teaches religious freedom? That was a survey question. Do you agree that the Bible teaches religious freedom? And if I'm remembering correctly on the giant display that showed the results of these different questions, I believe over 80% of the people who were visiting the museum responded yes that the Bible teaches religious freedom. 
Now, friends, my response, at least to you, regarding this would be that if we think that the Bible teaches religious freedom, then we are treating the Bible, we're treating the Word of God like an Instagram reel or a cable news show. And don't get me wrong, I, I'm glad that as, as uh, Americans, we, we uh, believe in religious freedom to the extent that we don't persecute uh, uh, other religions and, and people can live in that, in that kind of security. But I have to tell you, as, as un-American as it sounds, the correct answer to this question is no. The Bible does not teach religious freedom. Because Jesus is not just suggesting a way of life as an option among many. Why? Because there is no life apart from Jesus. Jesus' word says with astonishing authority that true freedom is not in getting to pick your own way of life, but finding the true life in Christ. Friends, Jesus' word is a word of law. It's how we are supposed to live. It, it, it tells us who we are and, and how we are supposed to think and how we are supposed to speak and how we are supposed to act. So, as Christians, we strive to live in harmony with God's word. We live by the word in our attitudes, and we live by the word in our priorities, and we live by the word in our habits. So let me ask you, if someone observed you for a week, and they had your brain hooked up to one of those mind-reading machines, and they got to see what your mind was always saying on a screen, right? And they, they took notes on how you spend every minute of every day, and they analyzed your routines, well, what do you think that they would say that your attitudes and your priorities and your habits are? And if they were observing you and analyzing you like that, what do you think that one word or phrase would be that they would use to describe your week? And what do you think that they would say that the authority is that you live by? I got to say, asking all that kind of freaks me out. It may maybe it makes you squirm a little bit. It makes me a little itchy, right? I, I think that the worst invention in the world will be a mind reading machine. That thing just should never exist, right? Uh, I don't really want that hooked up to my brain to, for all the world to see. I'm guessing that most of you probably would not want that hooked up to your brain for most of the world to see, right? It makes us pretty uncomfortable. That line of questioning really freaks me out. And do you know why? Because I know that I would fail spectacularly. As much as I want to live in harmony with God's word. And as much as I know I should live in harmony with God's word, friends, I know that I cannot accomplish that. And, and don't get me wrong. The discipleship is, is all about living by God's word. Discipleship is all about changing our attitudes and changing our priorities and changing our habits to be more and more like Jesus. And you know what? By the power of the Holy Spirit, we slowly get better at that. But friends, the good news is that that's not all discipleship is. Discipleship is not just living by God's word. In fact, we could even say it this way. Disciples only live by his word because we first live under his word. 
Because you know what, friends? Jesus' word is not just a how-to for life. It's not just a guidebook, and it's not just a manual for how to live. Because Jesus' word also has the authority and the power to actually do what it says. And in fact, you can go back to that scene that Mark shares with us from the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Look at what happens while everyone is marveling at the authoritative teaching of Jesus. Look what happens next. And let me read this for you and, and, and listen as I read this. It says, And immediately there was in their synagogue, while they're all around and listening to Jesus teach, there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. Now let me pause there. Friends, if Jesus' word was only a suggestion or an opinion or a how-to for life or a manual or a guidebook, do you think the demon would actually take Jesus' advice? Jesus' word actually has the power to do what it says. It's more than just a manual. Jesus rebuked him saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him and they were all amazed. So they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Friends, even more astonishing than the authority of Jesus' teaching was the power that his authority had to do what it says. Friends, here's the truth. Your life will often not look very Christian or very godly. That's just the truth of the matter. Because you are a sinner. And because you are mortal. And because you have enemies. Because you have addictions and temptations that you might never overcome. And you have aches and you have pains and you have sickness and you have disease until the day that you die. And in the meantime, you have relationships that will turn sour. You will have a world that is trying to tear you away from the truth of Jesus And you have Satan always on the prowl trying to devour you. And no matter how hard you try to live in harmony with God's word and how much you you, you try to to make sure you live as a disciple of Jesus in your your attitudes and habits and priorities, guess what, friends? You will never be able to overcome the fact that you're a sinner, you're mortal, and you have enemies. But friends, the good news is that the gospel reigns over your life. The gospel reigns. No matter what happens in your life, you live under the authority of Jesus' death and his resurrection. You live under the word. You Live under God's word, God's word that declares your sins forgiven and atoned for. God's word declares your death has been overcome by the cross of Jesus, and God's word declares that Jesus' empty tomb is also your empty tomb. And God's word has claimed you under its protection in your baptism. And not even Satan himself can snatch you away. 
Who you are is someone who is under the reign of the authority of Jesus, even when it does not feel like it. I, I got to tell you that, that on, on your worst day, when you've committed the worst of sins, when you've messed up the most and it feels so ungodly and it feels like God is far away, on your worst day of, of what it feels like to be a disciple, you are the same and you are under the same word as when it feels like you're on your best day. You're, you're just winning and you got an A plus in discipleship for today and everything's just going right. And man, you, you can feel the spirit going. And guess, guess what, friends? Both of those days, you are the same before Christ. You are under the same reign of the gospel. Friends, whatever words could describe your next week, those words can never trump the gospel's reign over you. And it's only because we live under the word that we get to live by the word. So I want to ask you as you go into your next week, how can you remember that you live under the reign of Jesus this week, even if, and maybe even when, this week doesn't feel very godly. And I'll also ask this, how is the Spirit calling you to live not only under the word, but by the word of Jesus in your attitudes and your priorities and your habits this week? Because, friends, the truth is, Christ has come for you with his life and with his death and with his resurrection and with all authority in heaven and on earth. And that means that no matter what we face in this life, even death itself, it should, if it should come for you this week, Christ always has the last word. And so that's why we live by the word and under the word. In Jesus' name, amen.